Good morning. Good morning. My name is R.J. Bronco. I'm class of 2004. I'm also an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. I'm currently the CEO and president of a private equity credit fund here in the city. It's called Indian Land Capital Company. We lend money uh, to federally recognized Indian tribes throughout the United States for land acquisition, economic development, and government infrastructure projects. I also serve on Dean Jenkins' Law School Board of Advisors. And within the Board of Advisors, I'm on the Academic Engagement Committee. The Academic Engagement Committee consists of eight alumni board members and three faculty members. The Academic Engagement Committee is to foster and develop a faculty alumni partnership to enhance the academic excellence of the law school, including both the quality of student learning achieved and the quality of faculty research produced. Part of our role is to create CLE events throughout the year that engage our alumni with the law school's esteemed faculty. We're excited to finally hold an in-person event. And today, we welcome Professor Oren Gross and Pro Professor Fadula Ni Alun speak about the laws of war as it pertains to the events of the Russia-Ukraine war. Professor Oren Gross is the Irving Younger Professor of Law here at the law school. He is an internationally recognized expert in areas of international law and national security. He is also an expert in the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Professor Fanula D. Ni Aloin, the mouthful. Is the University Regents Professor, holder of the Robbins uh, Rabina uh, Chair in Public Policy and Society, and Faculty Director of Human Rights Center at, here at the law school. She is concurrently a Professor of Law at Queen's University of Belfast School of Law. Dean, Professor Ni Loin, was appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council as United Nations Special Repertoire on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms While Countering Terrorism. In this capacity, she works closely with the states and the United Nations entities to advance human rights protections some, in some of the most difficult contexts globally. She was reelected by states for a further three-year term in 2020. With that, I will turn it over to Professor Gross. Thank you, Audrey. Um, thank you uh, all for coming. Um, I want to uh, start by uh, thanking the Academic Engagement Committee, uh, Jamie, where are you, Jamie? Jamie there, who's uh, one of the uh, two co-chairs, and Jim Paradico, which is not here, who's the other co-chair, and uh, Katie Jacobs from the Advancement uh, uh, Office, who, uh, Ken Jacob, who put it together. So thank you, Katie, for doing this. Um, so two things about uh, how we kind of thought uh, running this uh, today is I'll start and give you a bit of the layover uh, as far as the rules pertaining to the laws of war. Uh, really briefly, I'm not going to, you know, there's a whole seminar and then a whole course on these matters here at the law school. Uh, and it's way too early and way too cold outside to do all of that. But, you know, a, a, a short synopsis of the relevant laws, maybe a, a quick tour on the legality of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. And then uh, Fanula will take it from there. She just came back from the Balkans and talk about kind of what's going on on the ground uh, some views on future settlement, where do we go from here? Then we'll open it up because I think it'll be much more interesting to have a back and forth. And um, I'll use, by the way, this opportunity, you know, uh, I'll start and then, uh, well, some, some I intended, we'll go to the heavy guns uh, with Fanula. Uh, Audrey mentioned that um, uh, other than her uh, position here at, at the university, she's also... Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on Human Rights and Counterterrorism. And I can give you hot from the press, as of 20 minutes ago, uh, there is a public announcement that Fenola will conduct the first ever UN visit to Guantanamo, to the detention center in Guantanamo, in her role as Special Rapporteur, leaving tomorrow. 
Um, so, you know, we, we, we can do that as well. We can do many more sessions uh, about this. Stuff. Okay, so I, I you know, we are not going to assume that uh, all of you took international law when you were in law school, uh, and uh, or if you did take international law, that you remember everything you studied in international law. And I promise you that I'm not going to cold call on anybody. All right? uh, but when we talk about international law, and specifically in the context of the laws of armed conflict, uh, we're really talking about two sets of rules. We can also talk about are they relevant, but we are talking about two sets of rules. We are talking about the use uh, ad bellum, or the laws about going to war, right? Uh, when can you engage in use of force against another country? And we are talking about the use in bellum. What do you do when you're actually fighting? What tactics can you use? What weapons? Can you use right? Um, and both of these are obviously relevant to the conflict that is ongoing. So the use ad bellum, the going to war, can uh, answer such questions uh, as: Is the Russian invasion of Ukraine lawful or legal? And I'll again say a few words about this. The use in bellum will talk about such things as: Can you use suicide? drones, uh, what targets are permissible targets? Uh, what happens when you're attacking a hospital, right? And you're saying you're attacking the hospital because, well, there were weapons caches near the hospital, right? So what are legitimate targets? Who's a legitimate target? What weapons can you, can you not use uh, against uh, enemy forces? Um, the general contours, when we talk about the use of the to going to war, are relatively easy. The problem, by the way, with all those rules, as is frequently the case with much of law, the rules are clear. It's the application. All right? The rules are clear. So, for example, in the use of the law, the going to war, international law now says you cannot use force your international relations between countries with two exceptions and only two exceptions. Right? One exception is self-defense, either individual or collective. The other one is basically the Security Council right? going to war or authorizing the use of force, as was, for example, the case in the first Gulf. There is no Security Council authorization for the Russians to uh, use force in Ukraine. So really, realistically, the only right, basis uh, that the Russians can invade is if they, in fact, can argue self-defense. They are actually trying a third type of argument, which is what we call humanitarian intervention. Right? They're saying, oh, uh, there's genocide going on in you know, Donbass, uh, and so we are intervening to protect Russian nationals or those or who are uh, ethnically Russian. We are intervening to protect them against genocide. There is a whole history for this argument. But the short of it is, even if it might be a legitimate argument, and there might, there might be some scenarios in which intervention to prevent genocide, in fact, are legitimate. Under existing international law, it is still illegal. Right? So there is no precedent under international law to say that humanitarian intervention is lawful, even if it's legitimate. So that's gone. The only thing that the Russians can argue is self-defense. I'll come back to that in a that's the going to war. Keep that in mind. Now, what happens when we are in war? There is frequently right, the tendency to say that, you know, all is fair in love in war. Well, I'm not going to talk about love here. But certainly, in war, this is not correct. The fact that I can do something doesn't mean 
that I can do it legally. The fact that I have certain weapons doesn't mean that I can use them. The fact that I can maybe use certain tactics doesn't mean that I can do so legally. War is not, and and, it may sound kind of better, it's not the antithesis of law. There are rules to what you can and cannot do lawfully, legally, in war. To give just one example that we were reminded of this past Sunday, even where violence is permitted, there are limits. Think about football, right? The Bengals fans, right, were reminded in the last 15 seconds of the game against the Chiefs that even in a football game, there is unnecessary roughness. There are rules, you know. You can try and basically kill the quarterback of the opposing team up to a certain point. And beyond that certain point, it's unnecessary roughness, and you'll get a penalty, and they'll score a field goal, and you will lose the chance of going to the Super Bowl. So, too, is in the laws of war. There are limitations about what weapons you can use. There are limitations about what tactics you can use. Right? And those, by and large, by and large, are respected. The fact that we see violations, not by the way, not everything that we see and we think of as a violation is necessarily a violation, but the fact that we see violations is, I would say, by and large, an outlier. To use a sentence that uh, Lou Henkin uh, used and coined many, many years ago, most countries obey most of the law most of the times. It's true also, actually, I would argue, in domestic criminal law. Most people obey most laws most of the time. The problem is what happens when you see the outcome. So a few things about kind of fighting, right? What you can do uh, uh, when you fight. There are, I would say, four and a half, five core principles that when you read the news about Russia and Ukraine, when you read the news about any military conflict, You should always think about those five principles because those five principles basically line up the questions and the answers as to whether or not something is or is not lawful. Extinction, military necessity, uh, unnecessary suffering, proportionality, and avoidance. I want to just run quickly through them without, again, going too much in, but we can leave it to later. Distinction or discrimination answers the question, who can be targeted? What can be targeted? So, for example, we know that civilians cannot be directly targeted. You can only directly target military objectives, right, and soldiers. So, again, violence can be lawful, but it's not unlimited violence. You cannot target civilians. Military necessity comes and says, well, we allow violence, but it needs to be controlled violence. We understand you're engaging in war. are unlawful. Not all military conduct is unlawful, but we need to cabinet. And so we allow you, right? to use force to achieve legitimate military goals, as long as you don't unnecessarily rough the quarterback. And in a sense, all the rules about conduct in war are an attempt to do strike a compromise between humanitarian concerns. How do we make sure that civilians, soldiers are not mistreated? And military necessity, we understand that you're going to war in order to win. And if we say to countries, you can fight, but you cannot use weapons, they'll say, well, that's a joke. I'm not going to, you know, abide by such rules. (laughs) Unnecessary suffering pertains to soldiers. We understand that you're going to cause 
immense harm, including death to soldiers. But use only that much force that is, in a sense, unavoidable to achieve legitimate military goals. Don't go beyond that. It's the don't add insult to injury. Right? So, for example, just to give you one example, uh, expanding bullets, but we call also dum dum bullets, those that kind of expand in the body upon impact, are prohibited in the laws of war. The idea is that normal bullets can stop a soldier. You don't need to add that added injury. Right? And this is something that goes to when you start talking about weapons and trying to figure out which weapon is or is not permissible, a lot of times it's about this notion of unnecessary suffering. And what sort of weapon will cause unnecessary suffering? You can talk about blinding laser. Uh, you can talk about napalm. You can talk about, you know, uh, uh, flamethrowers. You can talk about white phosphorus. A lot of the discussion is about this principle. Proportionality. I would argue that in a sense, proportionality is the most difficult of all of them. And proportionality in the laws of war means something very particular. It's not necessarily what we think of as, as proportionality. It's a, it's a term of art. When we talk about proportionality in the context of fighting, we're basically saying, look, certain permissible or otherwise permissible military attacks are not going to be permissible because they are disproportionate. And they're disproportionate when we think about the anticipated harm to civilians, the anticipated harm to civilians, and it must not be excessive to the expected military benefits out of an attack. This is where collateral damage comes in. Right? The anticipated harm to civilians. So it's not that the laws of war are saying no civilian can ever be harmed. That's not the situation. You cannot directly target a civilian. But the laws of war also realize that when you, for example, target military targets, civilians may be harmed. As long as the harm to those civilians right, is not <clears throat> excessive to the anticipated mil or expected military benefits, that's still within proportionality. Needless to say, there is no hard and fast rule. What's proportionate is 30 to 1, 30 civilians to one soldier. Is that disproportionate? 5 to 1, 1 to 1? There is no yardstick. Right? So we are engaged in assessments that are highly contextualized. I'll give you just one sense. Imagine for a minute, imagine that you are the decision makers and you are told that uh, um, your drones, your pilots have uh, detected Osama bin Laden. Right? Driving in a car towards the caves in Tora Bora. They tell you, well, if we don't take, we have a window of one minute to take him out. If we don't take him out now, we're going to lose him again. Right? The arch nemesis, the arch rival of the United States. We have an opportunity. We have drones overhead. Let's assume scenario number one that he's alone in the car. Sure. So number, scenario number two, he's in the car with uh, three additional ISIS you know, fellow fighters. Not a problem. Now let's start adding civilians. Let's start adding Wives, we had a number of, and now let's add children. Right? If you think about the raid in Abbottabad, we had that scenario. At what point do you start saying, um, maybe we can't take the shot? This is something that military commanders wrestle with on a daily basis. Right? How much of a collateral damage, anticipated collateral damage, is or is not permissible. And that leads to the fifth and final principle of avoidance. 
Soldiers must take feasible precautions not to harm civilians and to avoid incidental harm to civilians. How much is feasible? What does it mean, feasible? All right? Imagine Fallujah. Let's assume that uh, we know that uh, all civilians left Fallujah, or most civilians left Fallujah, not all. Most civilians left Fallujah. Can we give an order to strike from the air and flatten the area, or do we need to put foot soldiers, knowing that soldiers will die in the process in order to minimize harm to civilians? How much feasible is feasible? To give another example, you know, just came back Bosnia Herzegovina, so I'll take Kosovo. When the United States intervenes in Kosovo, the rule is we don't fly below 15,000 feet. Why? Because their artillery can't hit the planes. But the higher you go, the higher you fly, the less accurate your bombing is. The less accurate the bombing is, more civilians are going to be killed. Should you order your fighter pilots to fly low in order to become more targeted? Right? What's, again, what's the ratio, so to speak, of risk to your own soldiers in order to protect their civilians. And once again, this is something that military commanders need to evaluate continuously. Okay, having set kind of the legal stage, and we can come back to that more, I want to turn the floor to Fenil to talk a bit about the practice, and then we'll come back and uh, open up the floor for Q&A. Orrin's talked about some of the formal rules that apply to the regulation of armed conflict. And I think one of the things I would underscore, as he's already said, which is that often there's a view that law, war is a kind of a lawless zone and that there are no applicable rules. But actually what's very obvious if you're on the inside for most states, that actually war is a highly regulated space. That doesn't mean there aren't breaches, but that nonetheless states think very seriously about the law of war and actually argue both the legality of war in legal terms, not in moral or in political terms, and also argue the conduct of hostilities in legal terms. And I want to talk a little bit about the more sort of maybe on the ground context. So as UN Special Rapporteur, I was in the Western Balkans just last week. So I was conducting a country visit to assess Bosnia's compliance with international law and its counterterrorism and security activities. And so um, partly, of course, because it's a neighbor, much of the regional context was very evident. So I want to make a couple of remarks about that and then talk to some issues of accountability, issues of political settlement. And I think what the war in Ukraine, maybe to reflect on what some of the kind of meta changes to international law, or at least to international institutions have been from the war as it's progressed. So one of the things we see is that, of course, the conflict, while many of our eyes are focused on the territory of Ukraine itself, actually there's a broader process of destabilization that's happening in the region. And that's happening for a number of reasons. One is just to state the obvious that the fact of hostilities has led to a massive exodus of humans from the territory of the Ukraine. So we've had massive displacement. Some of that is internal displacement to Ukraine itself, but much of it is displacement to neighboring and other states. And I think that speaks to also some of the stressors that neighboring states are facing in terms of their capacity to absorb, um, in effect, millions of people who have departed the territory that is uh, experiencing armed conflict. The second thing is just a really obvious point is that not all conflicts are equal. And so the willingness of neighboring states to accept refugees, asylum, and displaced people uh, for white European Ukrainians is much higher than the willingness of states to accept uh, non-white people um, seeking to flee conflicts that are maybe just a little bit further away, uh, Syria being the prime example. 
um, when the war first broke out, I was in um, Geneva for my UN role and I was sitting with the Pakistani ambassador who was like distracted. He kept looking at his phone and he kept apologizing. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, well, what, what's <laughs> Why are you not talking to me? Anyway, he was talking to his phone and his and his point, he said to me, well, look, he said, I have, I have a couple of hundred Pakistani students who were studying in Ukraine and who are trying to get across the border. And they kept, they keep being stopped at the border. <laughs> so and um, not all conflicts are created equal and not all, not the, and the willingness of states to accept the consequences of that conflict are not equal. So, so one regional destabilizer has been the movement of people. And the second regional destabilizer, I would say, has been a broader Russian ambition or destabilizing tactics in the region as a whole. So there are a number of countries in which we see that quite clearly particularly in the West, Western Balkans. And um, the first is Bosnia itself, uh, particularly in this part of Bosnia called the Republic of Srpska, where we've seen evidence of, um, again, uh, Russian presence and Russian efforts to encourage secessionist tendencies by, uh, by Serb nationalists, which is echoes an earlier war in that period, in that region, in Yugoslavia. Um, we see the presence of um, non-state groups like the Wagner Group in some of these. In, so, so Wagner is a, a is a military contractor which is very present on a number of territories, including but not only Ukraine, and um, and other what we would call far right paramilitary groups like um, the sort of motorcycle groups and other groups that have been infiltrated and and significantly encouraged by the Russian Federation in their destabilizing activities. So we certainly see that in Bosnia. We see it in Serbia itself, which has played this very, um, I would say, um, unique role in sort of being trying to be friends with everybody. Kind of hard to do, <laughs> but some states are doing it. Um, and we see it in states like Montenegro. So there's like a regional destabilization. And if one listens to, I think, the Russian position on many of these things, it is that the broader Slav peoples have yet to decide where their borders land. And therefore, some of these activities are really about undermining the territory and integrity of not just the state of, U of Ukraine, but a number of neighboring states. Um, the third thing I think we see in the region is, um, and I want to say I think this is particularly challenging, is we're seeing a massive influx, as we know, of military armaments and military support to Ukraine. I won't be popular for saying this, but um, I think there's enormous pressure to militarily arm and support Ukraine to um, be able to have a, what we might call a level or superior place on the battlefield. But I think we all have to remember that as we're starting to see in the context of discussions about Ukrainians' capacity to manage these kinds of weapons and the integrity of the security sector in Ukraine, the accountability of the security sector in Ukraine, and that the implications of that scale of weaponry going into um, Eastern Europe has long-term consequences that go beyond the war that we all should be extremely wary of. And uh, meaning that weapons that go to states who can't hold on to them very well tend to end up in non-state after hands. They tend to move. And I think for Europeans in particular, we need to think, and for Americans who are providing these weapons, we need to think, I would say the cautionary principle should apply here while accepting and acknowledging the pressure on the United States and its allies to provide such weapons, mm -hmm. the consequences of weapon dumps mm -hmm. into places like Iraq and Afghanistan should be remembered, meaning that you may live with the consequences of those weapons in those places for a very long time. So short-term thinking here, I think, is particularly challenging. And the other thing I would say about the regional consequences is we've seen a rush to um, put states on a fast track, some willingly and some just encouraged to NATO. And, and I tend to be a little bit more skeptical about those fast tracks as to whether those are a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think there are long-term implications for the potential to produce a settlement. There will have to be a settlement on this conflict by these fast-tracking activities into NATO. We can certainly talk about that in the Q&A, but I think 
that move, which looks like a security-centered move to help states feel secure, may actually limit our capacity to engage with a, a, a holistic settlement uh, with the Russian Federation, which we will have to make at some point. And the, the same is true of the European Union. We've seen a decision, for example, to put um, Ukraine on an accession process to the EU. I'm also going to sound like somewhat of a skeptic here in saying that the criteria for European U Union membership, both legally, politically, and economically, are extremely high. The capacity of a state like Ukraine to meet those criteria any time in the short term are really limited. And those issues are not just wartime issues. They're issues that predate the current situation in Ukraine and have to do with rule of law, governance, accountability for the security sector and corruption. And so the fact is that the signaling about joining the EU, which of course has strong symbolic and emotional resonance to some of these states. So for example, Bosnia just got also put on an ex, because of course you can't do one and not do the other. So there's lots of people suddenly on tracks to join the European Union. But I think again, there are questions as to the viability of that as a legal or economic matter. And there are questions as to what the implications for that will be for the settlement. Um, all right, let's say, let me say a little bit about accountability. So as Warren said, I think we're all aware, we're watching the news and seeing um, an enormous amount of reporting about atrocity crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, and, and potentially perhaps genocide. Although I think, frankly, genocide is an overused word. There are very specific legal criteria that meet the threshold for genocide under international law. In my view, they're not likely to be met in, the, in, in, in Ukraine. Um, but I also think one of the things we have to be very careful about as lawyers, and this is the point that Oren made, is that not everything that looks like a breach of someone's human rights is a war crime. And these are two quite different standards. It is not against the law of war. You may not target civilians deliberately, but civilians who are caught up in the context of military targeting uh, may in fact be lawful targets. So that's a complicated and not often uh, welcome or palatable discussion to make for folks to have. But it is to say that not everything you see on your TV screens that looks like a grievous human harm, as it may well be, actually constitutes a war crime in terms of international law. Um, so, But it's very clear that we have serious questions about the fact of such crimes being committed in this territory, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And let's maybe briefly think about the kinds of options we have to address those crimes. Well, one is generally when crimes happen on a state's territory, they should prosecute them. But clearly, um, we, it's unlikely that the Russian Federation will, will prosecute its, its soldiers. And I should say that's not a specific rule to the Russian Federation. It's a general rule that states don't prosecute their own soldiers. That is true of the Russian Federation, as it's true, has been historically true of the United States, as it has been historically true of European states. So that's not new, but then it leaves the onus on someone else to do the work. Ukraine is unlikely, uh, not least because it's not able to function very well, its legal system, its capacity to run trials, its capacity to gather evidence and run trials is very limited. So we're really talking about likely some kind of international mechanism to address uh, serious breaches of international law. The first place you would generally go to is the International Criminal Court, which is a treaty body set up by states to exactly prosecute these kinds of crimes. Well, it turns out that neither Ukraine nor Russia are parties to the ICC. So basically, you don't have a for that's not a forum for the purposes of this. So it sort of cuts out that existing mechanism. The second option would be to create what we might call a specialized ad hoc mechanism. So a special agreement by states to establish a mechanism, as we did, for example, in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, to prosecute crimes that happen in the middle of, a, of an armed conflict. And um, the catch to that is that generally the, the body to do that would be the Security Council. And right now, we have five permanent members, each one of them exercises a veto. One of those permanent members is Russia. It is very unlikely that Russia is like, it's like a turkey voting for Christmas. You are not likely to vote for a tribunal that's going to prosecute your soldiers and your military and civilian commanders for breaches of international law. So while there's a lot of talk about that, that seems unlikely. And there's discussions about other ways to do it. But frankly, as a kind of pretty conservative international lawyer, I don't see a way to establish that kind of mechanism easily through the security. It won't happen through the Security Council. 
And I think it's unlikely in the General Assembly. And so here's a, another point I would make, which goes both to the regional, but also to the global issue. In general, if you read Western newspapers, as we mostly do, there is a general view that we're all agreed that this is a bad war, that Russia is the aggressor, that serious human rights violations are being committed, and that we should all do something about it. But actually, if you read other newspapers in other parts of the world, we'll see that there's a far more, I would say, uh, I would say nuanced or different view of that war. It's not quite as black and white as we would see it here. And we see that reflected in the votes that we've seen in the General Assembly around the war. So the beginning of the war, a decision it was a discussion about taking Russia out of a number of bodies, like punishing them for their behavior in, in starting an aggressive war um, and um, doing so by taking away the kind of goodies of belonging to the club. So one of those goodies was Russia's seat on the U United Nations Human Rights Council, the body that um, has uh, appointed me. It's a, it's a human rights body that sits in Geneva. And Russia was actually removed from the council. So from one view, that looks like a victory. So we've signaled to a state engaged in this kind of behavior that it's not acceptable and we take away some of the goodies, like status goodies that they have. But actually, if you look at the votes, <laughs> it's not quite that simple, meaning there was a majority of votes in the General Assembly that took Russia off, but there were a large number of abstentions and a significant number of no's. And if you put the abstentions with the no's, actually, you're over the number that voted to take them off. So my point is more generally that we have to be careful in the West that our perception of how we are conducting our response to this war is shared with other parts of the world. Um, and partly that's because of a perception of selectivity about which wars we care about and which wars we don't. Partly it's about the perception of the places we're willing to seek accountability in the places that we're not. So we're willing to do that for Europeans, but we're not willing to do that in Ethiopia or Tigray, where people of color are being killed in an aggressive and brutal war that's lasted for uh, a couple of years now. So I think, again, this speaks to, going back to accountability, the difficulty we're going to have in getting consensus among states to set up some kind of unique or ad hoc tribunal that would address serious violations of international law through another mechanism. The other and final way to do this is through um, what's called the process of universal jurisdiction. So states, many states, have um, statutes that allow them to try persons who've committed war crimes on another territory. That person may not need to be a citizen or uh, of the country in question, and the, and the harm does not have to happen on your territory. The closest we have here is, which is, is the alien torts we've had is the alien tort statute as a kind of a universal jurisdiction statute, which has been largely diminished in its practice. But Congress just recently passed a new piece of legislation that provides universal jurisdiction for certain kinds of war crimes. And if you read the statute, you'll see that it includes very clear it's thinking about Ukraine, about the capacity to try people who um, might have committed war crimes who might come to the territory of the United States. But I would say that the number, the likelihood of sizable universal jurisdiction in large numbers of countries is going to be limited. It's been limited for other conflicts. There's no reason to believe it would be limited. What does that bring us to? I think it brings us to the sober realization that actually, even when the gravest violations of human rights are committed, actually the amount of accountability we can do, and I say we, the international community, is actually very small. That was true of Nuremberg in 1945. If we think about the number of people who were tried for the Holocaust, actually, it's pitiful. <laughs> we, we say we, it's good. It, of course, it's a positive that we had it. But if we look at the scale of the violations that took place and the actual number of people charged with serious crimes, whether in Nuremberg or in the tribunal for the Far East, it's tiny. Same is true of recent conflicts like the former Yugoslavia and, and, and Rwanda. At the end of the day, even with our best efforts and the investment, and I'm not saying that investment is not is worthwhile, but we have to be sober and realistic about the kind of accountability that we're likely to get through formal criminal processes. Which brings us to settlement, because the best way to prevent these human rights and laws of war violations is to have a settlement. And maybe just to say a couple of words about settlement, um, wars hopefully end. And when they end, they end through a political settlement. 
And let's be clear, political settlements are always compromises. That's the point. Nobody gets exactly what they wanted to end the conflict. The few places where we've not had that have been like complete victory. So the end of the Second World War, the complete kind of caving in or collapse of the Third Reich meant that there was a moment where you could make a, a kind of a fundamental new compact with the state that emerged at the end of World War II. But that doesn't really happen very often, and it hasn't happened since then. I don't think it's 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 likely to happen here. So we're going to have to make a political settlement with Russia. And in my view, one of the trade-offs in having punished Russia for being uh, engaging in aggressive warfare is that we've taken them out of some of the places where we could start conversations about having a settlement with them. So be careful what you wish for when you make those things, and also when you do it selectively. Russia is not the only country that's engaged in aggressive acts of conflict in the last half century, and we haven't punished those states quite the same way. So be careful of the precedents we set, but also understand that things that might like look good and are important in some ways can have these downstream effects that we're not aware of, that we don't fully think through. So a settlement will be made. And in my view, settlements will involve some kind of compromise. Now we hear very little appetite for compromise, but actually in order to make peace deals, you have to make compromise. And the compromises are not always palatable. They involve decisions about territory, and sometimes it's about ceding territory. Sometimes it's about making ad hoc or bespoke arrangements for places like Donetsk, perhaps also for Crimea. They may not exactly be the give back that we want. And of course, the challenge is that looks like it rewards aggression. And I'm not saying that there isn't that, that isn't part of it. But also the reality is, is that to stop wars, we make compromises. And I think we're going to have to make a compromise here and we have to find ways to have off-ramps for a state that doesn't currently have off-ramps in, in the context of warfare. The final thing I would say on that is that I see an enormous amount of wishful thinking that um, the current head of Russia will go away. I don't think any of us should wish for that, actually, at least in the short time. We've seen regime change as a motive for U.S. and other states' engagement in a number of places. And in my view, regime change doesn't work. It didn't work in Afghanistan. It certainly didn't work in Iraq. And look at us trying to do that in Syria. Bashar al-Assad still sits happily where he sits, and he's going nowhere. So the reality is the language of regime change doesn't get us very far. And what it tends to do is create highly unstable states that then further destabilize our economic, our political, and our legal systems. So um, it speaks to a certain kind of pragmatism in how we think about how we settle and how we offer a solution. Let me close by saying, I think that the, you know, there's a way in which you could look at this and you could say, none of it works. The laws of war don't work. Um, aggression is rewarded. The UN doesn't work. And, and I think I would say at the end of the day, and particularly about the UN, there's a sort of an assumption that the UN should go in and fix it. But the UN is no more or no less than the will of states. The UN is states, it's not something separate from states. And if states can't fix it, the UN can only fix what states are willing to fix in the ways that they're prepared to, to support the institutional capacity of the UN. Um, and so we've seen the veto. What, 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 what can I say is positive? Well, I think what we've seen is that we've seen some interesting maneuvering. So of course, Russia is exercising a veto as it is, can do as a P5 and other P5s have done it before. But there's been some really interesting workarounds on the Security Council, particularly to continue to bring attention to and address the violations of the laws of war that are taking place in Ukraine. And um, we also saw this really interesting move, like small states are the most interesting. So Liechtenstein, Liechtenstein, not a major world power by any measure, not a state that you think of as sort of a state that rocks the world and changes it. But Liechtenstein is actually a very nimble little actor in the UN space. And Liechtenstein came up with something called the Liechtenstein Initiative, which was seeing the Security Council veto, then created a mechanism voted on in the last couple of months at the General Assembly that when a Security Council power exercises a veto at the Council on these issues, then it has to come to debate in the General Assembly. So that might not look like much, but actually it's an enormous amount in that the costs for states of exercising the veto get higher. And so we've seen a number of debates as Russia has exercised its veto. We've seen a number of debates in the General Assembly where states more broadly beyond this sort of 15 group of states on the council get to um, articulate their views. Um, 
And I'll close by saying, you know, multilateralism is difficult at the UN these days. It's really hard when the P5 aren't functioning very well. The system is really difficult to move. And it's not just difficult to move on Ukraine. Think of grain. <laughs> Think of agricultural flows out of Russia and, um, and Ukraine. And um, think about just the challenge of fuel that we're seeing. All of these issues, they require multilateral solutions. We do not live in a, in a unipolar world, and we don't live in a world where states can't function without relationship with each other. All of that, I think, speaks to the need for concerted, consistent focus on ending the conflict. And that, in my view, is going to require some compromises. Thanks. Or, do you want to come down a little bit? Right? Yes. <laughs> sure. Hi, Scott. Yeah, go. Hello, you may have either explicitly or implicitly answered this already, but just based on your statements about different and understandings in the West versus the rest of the world community. Um, your yeah. moving comments. Would you tend to say that we are at least in the danger zone of the same kind of nation building visionary trap that America wandered into so disastrously in Iraq and other places? And is that present nations of Western Europe as well, mm -hmm. that, that danger at least? Yeah. No, or I might have a view on this too. I mean, I just think we tend to be quite narrow in the way we see our, like, of course we are. It's, that's obvious. We sit where we sit. We can only see the world where we see it. But I think it's a mistake not to see what's, what the response to the Ukraine crisis has been, has been in other places. In Africa in particular, if you look at the statement of African states, African Union states, the um, Kenya was on the Human and the Security Council and um, we currently have the Gambia on the screen. I mean, you, you can see in the statements of the African Union and China. And of course, part of the challenge there is our strategic, if anyone's read the national security, um, national security, um, the new national security policy of the United States, everyone, China is the big figure figuring in our, we realigned our national security thinking primarily as an inter- polar um, relationship with China. So we have to be thinking and seeing very closely what China is saying about this conflict, but also just um, um, the Central Asian states, Kazakhstan was back, the states we never think about, the states who are in Russia's sphere of influence and orbit. It's just a mistake not to see what, what this wider perspective on the conflict. That doesn't mean we have to agree with it. You don't have to agree with it, but you have to understand that your sense of the world should be nuanced and refracted through that. And yes, I think there is some danger that we we overstate the proposition of support for our particular position, and we understate the proposition of how others think differently about the problem and its causes. Meaning, if you read what other states are saying, they do not have the same view as we have as to what triggered this conflict. <laughs> you know, right? <clears throat> law, law, so what is law of war? It, it must predate. I, I'm just reflecting on uh, <laughs> the 18th century and um, the uh, when, a, when a battle was, was uh, when one, one side prevailed over the other, certain accommodations were made for the officers, the generals of the defeated side. And they could be, I guess, held or ransomed or whatever. Uh, what was your, what's your, so the laws of war are sort of the uh, reduction in, in the 20th century of um, rules of international um, uh, norms. So, so basically, you're absolutely right. I mean, as, as Fanon also said, war has been a ritualized exercise, right? Since time immemorial, I mean, go back to you know two armies standing in front of each other and each sending a champion. Whoever wins wins the the battle. Okay, so Putin takes on Zelensky and and that's it. Um, but and so there have been you know codes of chivalry, 
or what you can and cannot do. Uh, weapons have been uh, made unlawful. This is not a 20th century thing. I mean, the crossbow was declared unlawful in the 12th century by the church. And the reason, by the way, was, you know, uh, the longbow is fine because the longbow takes a long time to master. So who has a lot of time to master? The nobility. They don't do anything else but, you know, play with longbows. The minute that you introduce the crossbow, that means that peasants can now kill nobles. Well, that we don't want. Right? So that was, un that was made unlawful. But the modern rules that we are talking about now are really, really start in, on, on steroids in the 1860s. There's a, um, a period, there's a decade, 1860 to 1870, where there's a whole for historical reason we don't need to get into that what we really now call the modern laws of war start. And they deal with uh, mostly what do you do when you fight, right? The understanding is that there needs to be some limitations. And those limitations, by the way, are not just the abstract. Military uh, professionals, soldiers, commanders, understand that it's in their own self-interest to have those rules. It's, you know, don't kill, don't harm POWs, prisoners of war. Think of reciprocity. If we kill and harm theirs, they'll kill ours. We don't want that. Um, don't target civilians or don't do, we'll do it to them, they'll do it to us. Um, so there is a lot of self-interest here. And there's nothing wrong with self you know, as long as, you know, self-interest serves legal requirements, that's completely fine. The question is what happens when they start diverging, right? When self-interest and national interest seem to be taking you in a path that is completely clear of what the loss is. This is where kind of the challenges arise. Um, this is great, by the way. Thank you. This is, you answered all my questions along the way, so I'll, I'll ask it. Um, when you think of support provided to, by other countries, um, and the types of support, the types of armaments and, and types of tanks, are those decisions, policy decisions, or are those based also on the laws of war as well? So, do you want me, I'll stop the law and then you can go with yeah. the policy. And, and I'll stop the cabinet, I agree completely with them. The problem is, and we've seen this in other places, weapon does not dis weapons do not disappear. So, Right, wrong, wet, leopard tanks that are supplied will remain right in the region. Now the talk is about F-16s, right? The, uh, the Ukrainian, uh, was it uh, the Minister of Defense said, you know, uh, we asked for certain, uh, for harming missiles and they said no and then we got them. We asked for the tanks, they said no and then we got them. F-16, they're saying no, we'll get them. And then they'll remain. And the question is, who's going to control them? So I want to, two points about the law. As far as strict law, we have what is known as the law of neutrality. Right? So you can either be party to the conflict or you can be neutral. Right? There's no other. Um, the strict laws of neutrality say that you cannot supply, you cannot assist any part of the conflict, but if you do so, you become non-neutral, you become part of the conflict. So if you follow the strict laws, you might say any supply of weapons means you're not neutral. I don't think that those strict laws apply as such today. Mm -hmm. and there, there are several reasons. That there are both historical reasons and legal reasons. Legal reasons, I would say, even if you violate the law of neutrality, let's assume, in fact, right, you cannot supply, that does not turn you into a party to the conflict. A party to the conflict requires you to engage in acts of war. Acts of war is, for example, enforcing a no-fly zone. Downing a Russian plane is an act of war. Supplying the weapons is not that. You might not be, you might be violating the laws of neutrality, you're not a party to the conflict. But I would say that there's more than that. Since, since war is now made unlawful and war of aggression is made unlawful, I would argue that the law requires you not to treat defending parties and aggressive parties the same. 
right? So supporting those who are acting in self-defense is different than supporting those who are aggressive. To the extent that we think that Ukraine is acting in self-defense, right? Supporting Ukraine is different than legally than supporting the Russian. Remember one last thing. When does the United States enter the war in World War II? Quick question. I'm not calling call calling. When? Pearl Harbor. Right, right, right after Pearl Harbor. But remember what the United States does for years before. There's a land lease arrangement with the British. Right? We give them boats right, to find the Nazis. The United States is at this point still neutral, but provides weapons to the United Kingdom. Legally, I would argue, the United States was neutral then. I mean, neutral at least legally, if not politically. That holds true also now. That's as far as the law. Now to the policy. I mean... Yeah, I mean, just I would say Oren's analysis is right. I, I don't have much to add. I just I think I'm very disturbed by the scale of weaponry going into this conflict. I also think it's worth taking a really close look at the casualty numbers. So and these and I I don't want to sound like it, so any level of casualty in war is just you know is is enormously consequential for the individuals and for the. But if we look at the scale of Russian soldier casualties, we're at 128 thousand Russian soldiers killed in the conflict, I think, at last count. We look at Ukrainian civilians, I think we're just under seven and a half, maybe eight thousand civilians, which is, again, an unacceptable number. But it is worth thinking about the disposable lives of the soldiers in this equation, <laughs> that we, many of whom have been conscripted, have been sent without choice, who've been sent with ill-fitting and inappropriate armor um, that doesn't go into the calculation. We don't actually, we actually don't, we don't count the cost of soldiers' lives. We never have, whether it's the World War II battlefields or the, the Ukrainian battlefield. But I do think there's something to be thought about who will bear the cost of the weaponry and just the, this question about the long-term cost of giving that weaponry. We should also be clear on the other sides. The Russians are sourcing weaponry primarily from Iran and China, and um, there are some really significant questions about that kind of weaponry, which is much lighter, smaller weaponry, weaponry that's much more likely to diffuse and go um, through non-state armed groups. And bearing in mind that we have a number of non-state groups working in that or operating in the theater of war, I think there's really huge risks for just containment of the conflict. And again, destabilization in the region beyond the end of whatever this phase of hostilities looks like in Ukraine. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, maybe I'll add just one last thing and then we have time for one, one question. But just remember that Europe and the United States are not the only players uh, in town in supplying weapons. Uh, Russia is heavily being supplied, especially with drones by Iran. Right, who misses no opportunity. If there's a, an opportunity to stabilize, they will go. So again, there are impacts of this that will remain not only in this region, but beyond, because you know, if Russia is beholden to Iran, that impacts other things in other regions as well. So that also is something that we need to take into consideration. I think we have like one minute and we think we should ask all the questions yeah, and then yes. we'll do like a rapid fire 30 second response to all of them. So <laughs> hey, quick question in determining whether something is a war crime, any particular act in war is a war crime. Do you consider the the number of acts so you can destroy one electrical station that might not be a war crime, trying to destroy a dozen of them, would that be a war crime? Let's take, is there any, I thought there was another question, yeah. I'm just wondering about like the state of denuclearization with Ukraine having denuclearized and if you think that did play a role in the invasion and what that kind of means for international denuclearization going forward. Yeah. Um, just going back to the disconnect between the Western narrative and the rest of the world, I was wondering if you thought that that was more of a reflection of individual state interest or if it's more a dissatisfaction of um, international organizations in the global south. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think that we 
um, on this question of denuclearization, I think the causes of the conflict are deeply complex, actually, I think. And I think it's, I think while there's clearly aggression, I think we would be um, unwise to consider the longstanding grievance and issues that do arise in the Donbass and other regions. That's not to justify a, 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 an invasion on the basis of that, those grievance, but it is to recognize that actually, unless you see all the things sitting at the table and weigh them, however you might weigh them, you're missing something about how you're gonna solve the conflict. The same is true, and again, perhaps not a popular view. We don't have to cede the right, uh, the discussion of NATO, but the idea that there was some kind of pact around NATO membership at the end of the Cold War between Russia and the United States, um, I think has to be factored into understanding the causalities of the war. Again, it doesn't justify it, but I think we have to be careful not to give any weight at all to those things. Maybe on, um, remind me, it was on... Uh, um, the Global South. Oh, the Global yeah. South. Yeah, I would just say... Um, I think it varies. Some states, it's it, there's a sort of a very particular geo. It could be a geopolitical relationship with Russia or the United States that determines the way they vote and think about this. But I think we should also be aware that part of the global South is deeply disillusioned with Western forays into their territory on the basis of um, a perceived set of whether it's humanitarian, protective, or other interests. So. We don't come, I want to say we, the West, do not come to this war with clean hands, and we're not seen as having clean hands. Now, we might think we have clean hands, and that's okay, but if you don't understand that the other side doesn't see you that way, you're really missing something. So I think it's all of those things. Orin. Uh, the nuclear? Okay. So um, nuclear is really, I mean, there are two aspects to nuclear here. is both the, I would say, the realpolitik and there, there's the law. All right, and the legal question is a really complex one, uh, which really would merit a, a whole new uh, uh, talk about in what circumstances, if any, may a party use nukes? You might think that the answer is never. It's not that simple, right? Uh, the uh, International Court of Justice kind of opined on this and kind of left it open that there might be a narrow set of circumstances in which maybe the use of tactical nukes might be permissible. It won't be in the context of Ukraine and Russia, right? Because, you know, maybe in a scenario in which you're fighting in a desert where there are no civilians uh, and there's only military forces kind of lined against each other, and maybe you can use a weapon uh, because otherwise the existence of your country is at stake and that weapon will not have any impact whatsoever on civilians. Maybe then, maybe, that's not a scenario here. But that doesn't stop, obviously, threats of using nukes. There's a different question of what if you can... Remember, Ukraine had a whole range of nukes that it gave up, what would have happened had Ukraine kept them? So that's a different question, not a legal, but a very political. And uh, just serving back to the last or the first question, targeting 100 civilians is a war crime. Targeting one civilian directly is still a war crime. Right? Targeting um, uh, one non-military object is a war crime, as is targeting 100. So. The quantity here doesn't matter. Where it might matter is the possibility of not only being charged with a war crime, but also with a crime against humanity. Crimes against humanity require some sort of sustained, uh, um, I would say maybe adding the quantity to the quality. So when we are talking about crimes under international law, there are three of them. Crime of aggression, which is a different issue. That's the how you go to war. And then you can talk about crime against humanity. You can talk about war. crime against humanity might be relevant to question. Follow up sessions to this. This is fascinating stuff. And um, I think that we will uh, talk sessions as things develop. Uh, so thank you for coming and have a great day.